Welcome to the audiobook reading of the... You know, we need to come up with a better name than just the audiobook reading of the God in the Clear Rock. Got something like story time for adults or something. I don't know. You, I'll think on it. You guys think on it. I think on it. Together, we'll come up with a good name. Okay. Yeah. Let's turn off the music. There we go. And let's see what we got here. We'll reset the clock at 15 minutes. There we go. Okay, you remember what was happening? She was... Uh, yes, this is the right one. Mavise was... Uh, looking at the uh, the guard, the uh, dead body of the guard. That's right. Right? Have I done this one already? <laughs> I can't remember if I have. No. Yeah. All right. This is good. I just read it this morning, so it feels familiar. Okay. Anyway. All right. So, oh, wait a minute, the clock's going, I'll have to stop that. See, you're not wasting time, you haven't lost anything yet. All right, I'll start reading where you were and we'll, we'll catch up. The wall had carvings from floor to ceiling, but the carvings at the top were not the same as the bottom. The bottom had large legs, beaks, and wings of mythical half-man, half-creatures carved in vivid three-dimensional relief. The carvings had spaces behind them where the relief was on the back wall. It was in one of these spaces right behind the body of the royal guard that Marise was now staring. She would never know that the royal guard had crawled here on purpose just before he was stabbed in the heart by the murderous Spaniard. That's where we stopped. So now I'll start the clock. There we go. And... Uh, in the book too but the reason why he crawled over here the reason he would not move when the conquistador approached him the reason the reason he did not try to fend off the death blow which he saw coming was the same reason that marise now got down on her knees and looked closely at the wall with both her handheld spotlight and her headlamp 468 years earlier the royal guard who was the chosen savior of the god of the Maya, saw with horrified eyes what he had done, what sign he had left. And he knew what that visible sign would mean to anyone who saw it with their own eyes. So he did what he was trained to do, what he had been chosen to do, what he had to do in order to save his god. He sat up from where he already lay dying from two stab wounds to the abdomen, then he crawled over to the carved wall and laid against it, hiding the sign that he had mistakenly left behind. He held himself upright and balanced his weight on his right hand. He let his holy blade slip from his grip under his palm. Then he took his damaged left, ha left hand with its holy relic and slipped it between his legs. Then he waited. When the conquistador pulled the broken sword out of his heart, the hero guard was already dead, but he refused to let go. He held his body stiffly against the wall. His dying eyes were grateful to see the heartless murderer walk away after yanking off his holy necklace. But the guard did not let his body move from the spot against the wall. Blackness fell over the hero but his willpower froze his body in place, and it would not move for 468 years. He would keep the secret safe for all of that time, but he would give up that secret now. Marise looked closely at the slightly curved line in the back of the wall behind the carved legs of the mythical creatures, Extending down from a thin line that went back into the wall and looked like it was possibly a crack between two pieces of rock were four 
dark brown marks made from fingers. They extended from the deep crack line down. The deep brown color was clearly old, dried blood, and the finger marks even had prints visible in several places. More importantly, there was nothing on the rock above the small curved line. She followed the crack-type line around with her headlight in a loose oblong shape behind an open area in the legs and arms on the wall carving. When she finished her visual inspection, she was back to the four fingertip marks. As she looked closer, she could tell they were probably from the dead body beside her. One of the fingertip marks had a smashed tip. Marise also knew what that meant. There was a tunnel behind this wall. The god of the Maya, who was first the god of the Olmec and dozens more before that, did not know it. But she was about to be rescued again. And her time as the god in the clear rock would end. That's it for chapter 9. Now chapter 10. Time remaining, 17 years. Location, Unmarked Testing Facility, USA. Date, April 11th, 1995, A.D., 1042 A.M. No one's ever finished all five sections. The lead agent spoke in barely more than a whisper, even though the two-way mirror was as soundproof as the rest of the monitoring room where she and the other two agents were standing. That was 250 pages in under 25 minutes, the other agent was whispering too. All three agents looked like they were either mesmerized or in awe as they stared through the glass wall. When the third agent finally spoke, it was in complete amazement. It would have been faster if he hadn't stopped and straightened the stacks of paper between each section. Then he dragged his eyes away from the thick plate glass and looked over at the other two. What should we do? He's already finished. We can see that. He's just sitting there doodling in the air. The lead agent finally pulled her eyes away from the two-way mirror. You know the protocol, especially with this one. We wait until the time is up or until he presses the button and says he's finished. Then she turned back to the glass partition. After a moment, her jaw hung down slightly. She was unquestionably in awe. She'd never seen anything like this, and she'd been with the program since it began. On the other side of the double-paned panels, the boy with the big brain was getting really tired of this current test. In fact, he was getting tired of all the tests. It was not that he wasn't any good at tests. Oh, no, that was not the case at all. He was exceptional at tests. Testing was like a game to him, and he loved that game. It didn't matter what type of test it was. The boy always aced it. The child was gifted, and he knew it, which was one of the reasons why he was getting so tired of these tests. He knew all he was doing was proving to these people that he knew how to take a test, that he was smart, that he was smarter than they were. Hell, he was smarter than anyone he'd ever met in his entire 13-year-old life. He hadn't met anyone smarter than he was since he was 11 and took the first of these tests. After that first test, he began to be tested almost every day which was how he got into this current situation, locked inside a room where he sat at a table in front of a large plate mirror on the wall. The boy knew the mirror was a two-way mirror, which had people standing behind it. He also knew those people were talking about him, even as he was watching the slightly skewed reflection of himself in the fake mirror. In front of him on the table were five stacks of paper neatly spread apart and aligned by their bottom edges. 
The boy had taken the time between each section to place and straighten each sheet. A pen was sitting across the middle stack, opened but no longer being used. There was a stack of pencils at the end of the table next to a timer. The boy had snuck in the pen. He never looked at either the stack of pencils or the timer, which had 18 minutes left before it would reach the red arrow. The red arrow signified the end of the 45-minute allotted time period for this set of tests. The 13-year-old boy had the final page of the test in front of him, and for the last two minutes, he'd been doodling in the air over the bottom corner. He didn't touch the page. In fact, he didn't even look at it. He never looked at a test sheet once he marked it and moved on to the next page. He didn't double-check any of his answers on the test either. He never did. He was pretending to write out the first 27 pages of Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, his latest mental memorizing and recall practice book. His natural-born speed-reading ability allowed him to go through three complete encyclopedia sets before he was seven years old. And when he read through these numerous encyclopedias, he didn't just browse through the pages and look at the pretty pictures. He read every word from cover to cover of each lettered edition in three separate adult encyclopedia sets. Then he read 14 years of the Britannica update journals as well. And his memory, which he practiced on regularly, allowed him to recall every word of it. The young boy had a total conscious recall and a true photographic eidetic memory. For instance, he could recall when he took the very first of these tests, and he recalled vividly when the results came in. That day, he had been pulled out of class and taken to the middle of the empty auditorium. Then he was spoken to at length by a group that included the principal of the school, his teacher, plus three new people. There would never be less than five people directly involved in any aspect of this child's educational future again. His parents, however, were not yet involved. In fact, very shortly after his second IQ test, his parents would no longer find out anything about the young boy's educational future. The boy realized within a week what was happening to him. He also realized that he was not going to let his parents have anything to say about whether or not he would be allowed to do it. He'd been able to manipulate his parents for most of his conscious life, which, according to him, began inside the womb of his mother. He could recall things from an age where no one was supposed to be able to remember things. His mother constantly doubted whether or not the things he said he could remember were true. Once, when he was nine years old, he sat down and drew a perfect floor plan of the house they lived in when the boy was born. The family had moved out of this house when he was only 16 months old. The accurately scaled drawing had every piece of furniture labeled, marked, and in the correct position, including those pieces in the garage like the washing machine and dryer. When he was finished, he tore the sheet of paper off the legal tablet and handed it to his mom. Mom, what happened to our old couch? The one that was at our old house when I was a baby. The one I used to climb on against the wall here. He pointed to the drawing in her hand. She glanced at the drawing quickly, then did a double take. Where did you get this drawing, honey? Her head was now tilted slightly as she looked at the drawing with recognition. I drew it just now, he confidently told her. But that's not possible. You couldn't. She let her sentence trail off as she recognized the yellow legal-sized paper from the tablet in her work briefcase on the kitchen table. Suddenly, she realized the things her precocious son had been telling her about his ability to remember things were true. She looked down at the drawing in her hand and knew beyond the shadow a shadow of a doubt that her son was not a normal child. He was something special. And the boy also knew it, so it was no surprise to him when two years after that incident, he tested an IQ score so high that he was immediately retested because it was feared the testing was wrong or he had somehow cheated. But the second test did not 
assuage their fears or concerns because the second test came back much higher than the first, like perfect. When asked about the difference in his scores, the boy explained he had just gotten a new telescope and had been up all night before the first test, but he got a good night's sleep last night so he could focus on this test. Two years later, and the boy was still being tested, although now it was not in the same manner as the original IQ identification test that he took. These tests were administered to preteen U.S. children starting in the 1970s, and they continued into the late 90s when the program was terminated. The purposes of such tests were simple, to help identify those children who were considered special. They achieved this goal by using the standardized IQ test combined with batteries of specialized intelligence and knowledge evaluation exams. Children from all over the country who tested at certain levels on these tests were allowed to be moved into special advanced programs. Each state had different programs that were overseen by a certain obscure department in the federal government. But children who scored exceptionally high on any of these tests garnered the attention of the federal agency overseeing this innocuous Department of Education program. If these children scored high enough and they matched certain profiles, they were tested again and again. And each time they tested them, the number of students who would go to the next level got smaller. Finally, the number of children culled from this nationwide testing program had been cut down to 12. And that was how the first members of the elite, uber-intelligent teen super geniuses were found. In fact, it would be this initial group of 12 children that made the U.S. military adopt the first recorded use of the term super genius. None of the children knew of each other. They all came from different cities and went to different schools. They were involved in the normal program for advanced children in each of the schools they attended. However, the other children in these advanced classes at these normal schools were not like that one child who was a member of the intelligent uber geniuses which had been identified by this mystery federal group with both military and scientific backgrounds. We'll stop there. Ah, okay. Yeah. All right, let's see. Yeah, we're doing, you like the background, the black background? I can do different colors. I can do green. That's actually the color that it is, but not that color. It's a different green, but I can do white too. I like white. My wife says she can tell when it's a white background is not green screen, so I'm going to let her look at this one, see if she can tell. What's your favorite? Y'all let me know. Come up with a name. Y'all going to have to help. Come up with a name and help me pick which background. Do you like white? I like black, too. Black's kind of simple, straightforward. We can do the American flag. Yeah. Okay. Story time. No, not that's not. I'm doing the, the International Space Station footage because it was just cool footage, but I think I'll go with the black. And we'll clear out. The, there we go. Okay. All right. That's it, I guess. Uh, I'm playing the uh, out tonight. No, I can use the tape one. Well, what do you know? Let's do that one. All right. That's it. I'm out of here. Just the facts, ma'am.